The Lord be with you. What a joy as we uh, indeed gather in that promise, uh, as God uh, promises, where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst of them. What a promise that is, and uh, give thanks for that promise. A special welcome to our guests. We're glad that uh, you have joined us for worship as well. We would love if you would use one of the information cards in your pew to share more about yourself that we then in turn could share more about the programs and ministries of our congregation. A lot going on, it doesn't seem possible, but uh, this is already uh, the week before Palm Sunday. We enter Holy Week uh, in a week from today, and uh, give thanks again for that Lenten journey, which is very quickly uh, coming to a conclusion. A uh, reminder that this is the last week of our Wednesday services, uh, dinner at 6, church at 7. We have uh, a couple of our uh, wonderful cooks preparing goulash, looking really forward uh, to that. They'll be cooking, uh, dinner will be ready at 6 or whenever you can come after work, and then worship at 7. Uh, and during a Holy Week, a, a number of things going on again. Uh, on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, we have our two traditional services uh, at 7.30 p.m., uh, as well as on Good Friday, a noon service of prayer and preaching, uh, an abbreviated service on noon Friday. Uh, also on... Uh, Holy Saturday, the Saturday before, the day before Palms, or the day before Easter, a reminder that we have our Easter egg hunt uh, and inviting the community, a wonderful opportunity to reach out to them. Um, I'm not sure at what point you hit colossal amount of eggs, but we are literally going for 10,000 Easter eggs. Um, in two different groups, there will be a 10 a.m. and a 1 p.m. They'll be identical, open to all ages, but it was so unfathomably crowded last year. Uh, that we're trying to split it out, and um, if all things considered are equal, we'd love if you come to 1 o'clock. I think that'll be the lighter attended. Um, and if we spread out the eggs evenly, you know, more opportunity for eggs. Uh, but uh, more importantly, an opportunity to, uh, to reach out to our community. If you'd like to invite someone that you know, um, we have in the back eggs with little invites for information about it. You can take an egg, uh, give it to them. Uh, if you'd also like to join us after worship, we'll be uh, continuing to stuff Easter eggs. Uh, we've got thousands of them done and thousands to go. So if you'd like to join us for that, we would love a little help on that as well. Reminder, following our uh, worship service, Jubilate tickets are, are available uh, in the front entryway. Uh, that concert is coming up April 15th uh, at 4 p.m. There's a change on the time. Um, hoping we're getting the word out on that. It's always been at 7 for years past. It's actually at 4 o'clock, um, so a reminder on that event as well. As we uh, have so many things going on, and another thing that we've been doing over the last couple of weeks is we've been having a First Communion instruction um, and welcoming new members as well. We've had people in all of our services. Um, this morning, I think, I see Stephanie... Hoping Stephanie's not alone, but I think you might be in this service, Stephanie. We'd like to welcome uh, Stephanie to come forward, and we want to just uh, uh, receive Stephanie Casamano in, uh, as a new member this morning. We had uh, uh, three or four or more in the first service at 8 o'clock, and I know we have at least that many in contemporary as well. And she's going to bring along her adorable daughter as well, uh, and just take a moment uh, and welcome her. Good morning. Beloved in the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ uh, said to his disciples, whoever professes me before men, I will also profess before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. I invite you then, Stephanie, to lift up your heart before God and joyfully give answer to what I ask you. Do you this day in the presence of God in this congregation acknowledges the gifts that God gave you in your baptism? If so, say, I do. Do you this day uh, pronounce your faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you believe that the scriptures are the inspired word of God, that the doctrine of the Lutheran church drawn from them is faithful and true? Do you intend to hear the word of God and to receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word, and deed remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you desire to become a member of this congregation? And Stephanie, upon this your profession of faith, I welcome you as a member of Bethlehem Lutheran Church 
and invites you to participate with us. I mean, all the blessings of salvation that our Lord has given to us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's take a moment and welcome Stephanie this morning. And uh, just uh, what a joy it is. And as I said, we've had new uh, members in all of our services this morning um, and certainly grateful for their participation uh, with us. I'm looking, I don't think, again, I had a few in our first, is anybody receiving first communion today at this service? We got a number next week in, in contemporary as well. I don't think I have any of those this morning in here. So um, what a joy it is uh, as God continues to work in and through us and among us, growing his kingdom, uh, reaching out to those in need. Uh, what a blessing of that is. And indeed, that's why we're here this morning to celebrate God's gifts and his blessings that, that he gives to us. Uh, through his word, through his body and blood. And so I invite us to begin our worship service. We rise for our confession, or our invocation, and our opening hymn. Indeed, we begin uh, in God's name, the name in which we are baptized. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. I stretch out my hand to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Teach me to do your will. For you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Even as we cry out to the Lord for mercy, we know he is a gracious and forgiving God. Let us therefore come with confidence before the throne of grace to confess our sins and to receive absolution. Almighty God, whose compassion never fails, we come before you in penitence. We know that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Grant us your mercy, and spare us from the just punishment of our sin, which our Lord Jesus Christ has borne for us on the cross. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, that we may walk in the light of your love now and forever. God has promised to grant his forgiveness to all who repent of their sins and turn to him for mercy. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May our God keep you in his grace, lead you in ways of faith and obedience, and bring you to live with him forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. We thank you, Almighty God, that your rule is without end, and that your power extends over all the earth. In your grace, you have created us and have called us as your people. Accept our thanks for all that you have done for us in the past for all that you are doing for us in these days, and for all that you will do for us at the end of time. Send your Holy Spirit as our comforter and advocate to guide our living of each day as children of light to your greater glory. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you, this due in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup, 
And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated. By the working of your Holy Spirit, direct our lives, that we may bring that light of your grace to our world, that as your beloved children we may fulfill your fatherly will. This we ask in the name of Jesus, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The reading for today, the epistle, is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at the first verse. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober, for those who sleep, sleep at night and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came over, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Also he who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, 
I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not snow, so, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sowed and gathered where I have not scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given, but he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In response to God's word, we join together to make profession of our shared faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we're continuing in this sermon series, One Week to Live. We're looking at the last things that Jesus said and did um, in his life as, as he approached the cross. We believe that Jesus knew, or well, we know that Jesus knew that his time was coming. So we think that he was intentional about the things that he did and said in those last days. And so we in turn want to be intentional to look at what he did and said um, in those last days as we prepare for um, Christ's crucifixion or prepare for his um, death. Depending on who you talk to, about 70 to 80 percent of people dislike their boss. Now, I won't ask you to raise your hands if you're one of those 70 or 80 percent. It's possible your boss is here, and I don't want to get you in trouble. You can thank me later. Um, but 70 to 80 percent of people dislike their boss. So it's probably not surprising then that there's tons of stories out there about bad bosses. I found one story uh, where a boss, um, he got really angry one day. So he decided to throw his whole computer out an 11 story window. Now, because he was the boss, mm, about a month later he came back to work. There's another story about a boss who made his employees work through lunch one day. A few of them worked through lunch one day to help him finish a project. And so they decided afterwards that he was going to thank them by taking them out to eat. And so the whole way to the restaurant, the place they were going, he, he talked about this great restaurant where there was food from every country. It was just a smorgasbord of all this delicious food. And the employees' uh, mouths were watering as they went to the restaurant. 
But then the boss pulled up at Sam's Club, proceeded to take his employees to the free samples, right? Which sounds like something I would do because I love Sam's. But not the thing you want your boss to thank you for working hard with is not free samples. Or maybe the best one that really sums up maybe why bosses are challenging, why sometimes we have a problem with them. Uh, there's a story about a boss who was having a performance evaluation with, with one of his um, employees. So he called him in, he sat and listened to him explain what he was doing for the company and what all he had going on. After a while of listening, the boss shut him down and said, hey, um, I still don't totally understand what you're doing for the company, but you can work a little harder. You can accomplish a little bit more. Bosses have, in some ways, that responsibility of, of having expectations of getting work out of their employees. And sometimes that's justifiable, but sometimes the boss maybe doesn't understand everything we do. Maybe we don't think they're kind of missing something about what we're actually doing. So the boss can come in and sometimes they can feel a little harsh, a little challenging, a little difficult. So our parable today, I wanted to start out by completely simplifying our parable down. Something you could carry with you to explain this parable. So here it is, the parable, the kingdom of heaven is like. A parable is just an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so this is Jesus talking about the kingdom of heaven, both in this world, but also in eternity. But this is what Jesus says about it. If we're going to kind of condense the whole gospel reading down into one little statement, maybe you know where I'm going. The kingdom of heaven is like a demanding boss. That guy who you come in his office, you sit down and he says, huh, I know you're doing some stuff. I'm really not sure what that is, but you could work a little harder. Although Jesus does know what we're doing. He's Jesus. He knows everything. But the kingdom of heaven is like that boss who has, get this, expectations of us as members of his kingdom. So we're going to break that down. That's the simplified version. Let's break it down and talk about that a little bit more. Um, so we get this parable, this story about employees. So the employees are left. They call them servants in the text. The employees are left and their boss goes out of town. He leaves. But he doesn't leave them empty-handed. He leaves them with tasks to do, or more importantly, he leaves them each with a budget. One had five talents, one had two talents, and one had one talent. And the expectation was that they were actually going to accomplish something with what the boss had left them with. So the boss, after a while, we don't know where he goes, but after a while he comes back. And he sat, sits down with each of them. Let's read about kind of that meeting with the one with five talent. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. Or there's also one with two talents. And basically the same thing happens. He comes forward with the two talents more that he had made. Now, I think it's, it's important that you notice something about that. The one who made five talents, he didn't just invest the money. You wouldn't get double your return if you invested it. It's not going to happen. But to make five talents more, he had to risk the money. He had to give it up. He had to risk it in order that he might make more. Now we can understand this. Has anybody ever done a lemonade stand? Nobody? Oh, maybe a few of you. You can raise your hand in church. It's okay. I promise. Um, yeah, so some of you have done um, lemonade stands, right? So you have a certain amount of money. Let's say you have $5 that maybe you got as allowance from your parents. Now, if you're going to make a lemonade stand, you can't just kind of put that money um, in your piggy bank or hide it under your bed somewhere and make $5 more. What you have to do is you have to spend that money. You have to go buy ice and cups, maybe lemons, Maybe it's just the powdered stuff. But you have to buy stuff. You have to buy supplies. Now, your hope in doing that, if you're an entrepreneurial kid, is that you're going to spend that $5, and somebody's going to come buy your lemonade, and you're going to make more money. That's your hope. But you know what? You know what could just as easily have happened? That you could spend that $5 on supplies, and nobody stops at your lemonade stand. Maybe you have a bad location, maybe your lemonade isn't very good, but whatever it is, maybe you didn't do a good job and nobody comes. Guess what just happened to that $5? You lost it. 
And the same is true for the one that had five talents and made five talents more, the one who had two talents, who made two talents more. They had to risk the money in order to get a return. That's the only way they made the profit. So we see those two. But there's one more, right? We haven't talked about him yet. So the other person, he had one talent. But instead of doing something to make money, instead of risking it, he buried it in the ground and left it. But he brought it back to his master, right? He didn't lose the money. He didn't squander it. So you think maybe the master isn't as happy, but he wouldn't be mad, right? Actually, he is. In fact, the master's furious. He's upset. He's frustrated. He scolds and berates and accuses the servant of being lazy and slothful and not doing a thing. He has a big problem. The master has a big problem with that servant who did nothing. Uh, there's an image that I want you to think about that I think sums up this servant really well. Has anybody ever read the book, um, Where a Red Fern Grows? So this is his book. Um, it's basically about a boy with these two coon hounds. And I'm not going to give away all the story. It is a sad story, by the way. Um, but there's a boy with these two coon hounds, but he wants to train the coon hounds. By the, by the way, a coon is what we as Southerners call raccoons. Right? I, did, did you know that? Okay, uh, so a coon. So this boy has, uh, wants to, so he has to trap a coon, right? But the dogs can't hunt yet, so how do you trap a coon? Well, so what he does is he makes this trap. Here's a picture of it. Essentially what you do is that's a block of wood that's carved out, has a hole in it. You put a tin can, something shiny in the middle of that. And what the raccoon will do is that raccoons love shiny things. The raccoon will come, it'll grab the shiny thing, and guess what? He can fit its hand in the hole, but he can't pull the shiny thing out of the hole. So there's the raccoon stuck there. He has the shiny thing, it's in his hand, but he's trapped because he will not let go. The raccoon will never let go of that shiny thing that he has found, and he's trapped. He has it, it's in his hand, it's the one talent, and he's not gonna let it go. He's gonna hang on to it, cling on to it, and put all his effort into always having that he can. See, that's what the last servant is accused of. Having something of value, but not letting go of it. Now, so this doesn't turn into just a business analogy. Because, by the way, I'm not certified to teach about business. I, I shouldn't be teaching any of you about business, for that matter. Um, but we should ask the question, what is the talent? What is it? Now, maybe it's money. Some people have said that the talent is money. Maybe so. But you know what? I just preached about money two weeks ago. I don't want to preach about money again. Like, I'm done, I'm done with it for a few months, okay? But, but by the way, I don't think it's talking about money. Uh, maybe the talent is the skills and abilities that God has blessed you with, that you're supposed to take that and use that for others. I would say that's accurate to the Bible, accurate to Scripture, but I don't think that's what this parable is talking about. I would say that what the talent is, is it's the thing that we have in abundance that God has given to us. God's grace, truth, and love. God has bestowed on us that rich and great gift that all of us, every single one of us, have God's grace, truth, and love, and we have that in abundance. Or maybe a slightly different way to think about the faith that God has given us. That he has given us the ability to believe in his grace, truth, and love. Those are gifts that aren't a result of our work. It's nothing that we did, but it's how God worked in us. He gave us that faith. He gave us grace, truth, and love. And now we as Christians, we have those things in abundance. Every single one of you, you have God's grace and truth and love. You have faith and you have it in abundance. That's a gift that God has bestowed and given to you. You have it. You own it. But guess what? I told you this at the start. The kingdom of heaven is like a demanding boss. So, so what does that mean? Well, that means that God comes and he sits across from you and he says, hey, you've been given something. What have you done with it? I know what you've been up to, but you know what? You can work a little harder. 
That's the demanding boss. That's how Jesus comes to each and every one of us. He asks us, hey, what are you doing? And we're called to do something with those talents that we have been given. See, I think we as Christians, we run this risk. We run this risk that we receive the gifts, His love, His grace, His forgiveness. And then we kind of just hide it. We don't tell our friends and family about it well because what might they think about us? Might that change our relationship if we told them we were a Christian or told them about Jesus? So it becomes really easy for us to kind of be safe and to just kind of hide our faith in church. Leave it in the church pews. Leave it in our Christian Bible study. Read it, leave it in our home. Leave it in our Bibles. So we kind of just take the safe way out. We just kind of cling to that one talent. But maybe actually some of that comes from wisdom. Maybe your fear is that if you shared your faith, if you opened up about being a Christian, if you told other people what you believe, maybe they would argue against you. Maybe they would explain to you why it's not true. And maybe you don't feel like you have the knowledge, the ability to believe even if they tell you it's wrong. So maybe maybe you're afraid. Maybe you're scared about what they'll say to you, how they'll try to convince you that it's not true. So you just hide it somewhere. Like the raccoon, you just kind of cling to the faith, believing, well, I have to hang on. If I let go, I'm going to lose it. I think that's Satan's work. Satan wants us to bury the talent in the ground. He wants us to cling to it and never let go of it. But I think God tells us a different promise. God reminds us that it's not us that clings to our faith but it's Him that clings to us. That He's the one that creates the faith, that gives us the faith, that works to maintain the faith in our lives. And that frees us to have our faith with an open hand, sharing it with all those who we know. Why? Because we're never going to run out of faith. God is always going to continue to give us more than we need. He's going to give us more grace, truth, and love than we could ever need. So we share it. There's this odd text in here, where the master says this. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. What does he mean by that? Is that kind of exclusionary? Is that kind of the master saying, hey, the ones that made three, five talents and the one that made two, they can be in my kingdom. They can be a part of the kingdom of God. But the one that made one, like I'm going to cast him out and leave him there. And the parable kind of seems like that. It kind of seems like God makes a choice based on where you're going, based on what you did. But see, the reality is, is being a part of God's kingdom isn't based on our works. The rest of the Bible is clear on that. That being a part of God's kingdom, having His grace, truth, and love, having faith in Him, isn't because we did something. So why does it say this? I've been wondering a bunch about this, and I think it's true. What if the fullness of God's joy it isn't just you believing in Jesus, isn't just the faith that God has given you, which I would say is the greatest gift we could ever be. But what if the icing on the cake, the cherry on top, God's fullness of his joy is actually not just knowing God's love, but what if it's actually participating in his joy, in his kingdom? What if the fullness of God's joy is not clinging to the faith that we have like this, but holding our hands open and sharing it with everyone? Again, understanding that we can know that up here, that we can try to live that out, that we can try to share our faith every day, but that we're going to fail, that we're going to mess up, that we're going to sometimes do the wrong things. And guess what? That doesn't kick you out of the kingdom of God but you can return for the grace and love and forgiveness day after day after day. And that's the promise God gives us. But yet he invites us into the fullness of his joy to not just cling to that faith, but to share that with the whole world. And we pray that God would do that and do that great work through us. Please pray with me. Dear Jesus, Thank you for your grace and love and truth. Thank you for calling us your sons and daughters. 
inviting us into this place. The Heavenly Father, continue to build us up in our faith that we might share that with those around us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We worship God with our offerings and gifts.